Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 367. Welcome back to the program. In the news this week, I wanted to say a huge thank you to M.L. McClellan Lodge, number 357. I had the honor and the privilege to go out there this last weekend. You're listening to this maybe Sunday night, maybe Monday morning. Just this last Saturday, I went out there, and the plan was for me to do between one and three lectures. We ended up doing two lectures. I did Colonial Freemasonry, and we talked about the topic of Esoterics 101. We really explored both of those pretty widely. And it was a lot of fun. And I have to just say thanks to Brother Bill Palak, who uh, assisted in putting all that together, his wife as well, who helped arrange the event, and all the brothers who came out. It was uh, really incredible. I also got to meet some brothers from Battleground Lodge in Indiana as well. I sh- I'm sorry, I should have mentioned both of these lodges are in Indiana. It was a tremendous experience and just wanted to say thank you. It was uh, really awesome. And I think this upcoming week, I've also got a presentation happening via Skype in Kenton Lodge, number 1186 in Buffalo, New York. And I'll be presenting on the Chamber of Reflection, which of course is the version of traditional candidate preparation. And when I say traditional, I just mean an older version, maybe something used likely more in European concept lodges and also in your traditional observance lodges. Now, what's interesting is, of course, those different chambers have different symbolism and various implements that are shown inside a chamber to bring about a set of thoughts or feelings uh, pertaining to one's own psychological state. I guess I would put it in, in normal terms. And in some cases, the implements that are shown are more relevant to the degree that's going to be happening. But anyway, we'll be talking about that in that Skype presentation, and that'll be on the 24th, just in a couple days here. This week, we're going to go ahead and finish up our series on the Mother Grand Lodge. And then shortly right after that, I've got another piece, which I think you will all enjoy. And your app extras will, of course, be the papers that we read. I've got a backlog of emails that I'm working through to go ahead and get back to you guys. So I wanted to say thank you very much. And also that... I finally got a picture of the proof for the WCY producer's pin, so I'm really excited. I'll be sharing that. Likely, you'll have already seen it uh, because I'm going to launch the picture to show everybody here on Sunday earlier in the day before we release the episode. And if you're interested in getting one of those producer pins, then please head on over to WCYpodcast.com and pick one up. Uh, Right now, they are pre-order, so they'll ship as soon as they get in. I okayed the proof last weekend, so it should just be a couple weeks now before I get them in, and we'll go ahead and ship those just as soon as they come in. And every one of those pins is going to come with a personal thank you note from me to you, and I hope you guys will enjoy them. So that's the news. The Whence Came You podcast is brought to you through the generous support of Masonic Revival, contemporary Masonic designs made for today's Freemason. You don't have to settle for throwing a plain old square and compass on anything anymore. Now you get something truly designed and truly wonderful. Whether it's aprons, awesome pins, and wonderful neckwear, bow ties, ties, pocket squares, you name it, Masonic Revival has it. Head on over to MasonicRevival.com and check out what they have to offer. And make sure if you see Brother Edgar, tell him thanks for helping bring this program to all of you. And this program is also brought to you by all of you, those of you who support this program. We can't do it without you and your donations and all of your assistance, so thank you so much. To find out more about how you can assist this program, head on over to WCYpodcast.com and click on Support the Show. There you can make direct donations, sign up to be a monthly contributor, a fellow, or even a producer. And thanks very much to everybody for donating. All right, now this is the continuation of the Mother Grand Lodge series. We started two episodes ago. That would have been 365. If you didn't get a chance to listen to that one, I recommend going back and listening to that. Follow it up with the uh, second one. That way you're not lost here. But uh, these are separated in such a way and the way they were produced that they're not entirely dependent on the preceding paper, but it will help you if you decide to go back and listen to those. So this is, again, the Mother Grand Lodge, Part 3. This was a reprint from the Masonic Service Association of America and stems from February of 1929. 
The Mother Grand Lodge Part 3. There is a reason for everything, even for a superstition. If we seek far enough to find it, there was a reason, both in the spirit and the age of the state of the craft, for the quote-unquote revival of masonry in 1717. It was the fad of the day to form all sorts of queer clubs and secret societies, some of them with odd, fantastic names. Our craft was caught by that craze, but masonry lived while the rest were left in limbo. Why should it have been so? The cathedrals had long been finished and the work of the craft seemed done. The place for the master mason had been taken by the architect who, like Sir Christopher Wren and Inigo Jones, was no longer a child of the lodge, but a man trained in books and by travel. By all the rules, masonry should have died, or else reverted to some kind of guild or trade union, but it did not. Instead, men who were not working masons had long been joining its lodges, its quest of truth they had not found elsewhere. Put otherwise, why did masonry alone of all trades live after its work was done, preserving not only its identity and its old emblems and usages, but transforming them into teachers of morality and charity? Of course, in the end, only that lives, which is in accord with the need of man and the nature of things, but we may go further and say that masonry lived because it had never been simply an order of architects, but a moral and spiritual fellowship the keeper of great symbols and a teacher of truths that never die. Having reviewed the meager record, let us examine the facts more in detail. The new masonry was not merely a quote-unquote revival, it was a revolution. The craft had fallen to a low estate, following the rebuilding of London after the Great Fire. The new Grand Lodge was intended to give it a quote-unquote center of union and harmony, a community of action, such as it had not had for years, but it did much more. It gave the craft not only an old form with a new meaning, but a new spirit, a new force, a new direction, and sent it forward to a new destiny such as no one had ever dreamed. More than one writer has told us that the leaders of the masonry of that day were fuzzy-minded men who did not know what they were doing, but the results show that they were wise men, never more so than when they were careful to say that what they were doing was quote-unquote according to ancient usage, a phrase which still has magical power among us because masons love things old tried and lovely. They were doing things never done before, according to ancient usage, from time immemorial, and that was surely a rare feat. They made the past glide into the future without loss, using an ancient form to clothe a new spirit and purpose. The brethren who met in the Apple Tree Tavern constituted themselves as a Grand Lodge pro temp, in due form, and forthwith revived the quarterly communication of officers of lodges called the Grand Lodge. The quarterly meeting was never before called a Grand Lodge, so far as we are aware, but it became one nonetheless. Under the guise of reviving all old usage, they created a new form of organization, new, certainly in its power. No wonder there was a grand schism later on, made, as we now know, by lodges not represented at the Apple Tree Tavern, and who denied the right of a few men to constitute themselves a Grand Lodge. What was the quote-unquote due form with which the new Grand Lodge was constituted? A postscript to the record tells us that, quote, when the Grand Master is present, it is a lodge in ample form, otherwise only in due form, end quote. But what ritual, if any, was used on the important occasion? Nobody knows. Our brethren have practiced the virtue of secrecy too successfully for us to penetrate the veil. Some sort of ceremony must have been employed, but we do not know what it was, unless it was that found in the, quote, narrative of the Freemasons' word and signs, end quote, contained in the Sloan Manuscript. The Grand Lodge itself being a new invention, no doubt it set about revising and elaborating such rituals as existed, which developed into the ritual as we now have it. Under the guise of a quote-unquote revival, still further innovations were made when the four lodges met to elect a Grand Master and celebrate the Feast of St. John and the Goose and Gridiron Alehouse. The office of Grand Master was new both in its creation and in its amazing power, a power almost absolute, including the quote-unquote sole right of appointing both of his wardens. There must have been murmurs against it, because Anderson found it necessary to say that, a little later, that it was found, quote, as necessary as formerly according to ancient custom, end quote, whereas he was in fact attempting to justify a new fact by appeal to an old fiction since no such office existed in former times. Old usages were in evidence, to be sure, such as the observance of St. John's Day, the manner of voting by the show of hands, the badges of office, the tiled lodge to name no others. But 
if the new grandmaster wore an old badge of office, he himself was a new figure in masonry, invested with a new and vast power. His badge was a large white apron, though hardly so large as the one we see in the Hogarth picture. The collar was formed of much the same shape as that at present in use, only shorter. When the color was changed to blue, and why is uncertain, but probably not until 1813 when we begin to see both apron and collar edged with blue. By 1727, the officers of the lodge were wearing the jewels of masonry hanging to a white apron. Four years later, we find the Grand Master wearing gold jewels pendant to blue ribbon about the neck. As regards innovations, it is pointed out by Gould that the new Grand Lodge introduced three striking changes in English masonry besides those already named. First, it prohibited the working of the quote-unquote master's part, now probably the master's degree, in private lodges, as if it intended to keep the most sacred and secret part of the ritual within its own control. Not unnaturally, this provoked rebellion on the part of many and was done away with in November of 1725. However, it was a wise thing, because as Stuckley said in his diary, under the date of January 1721, masonry took a run and ran itself out of breath through the folly of its members. End quote. It seems that masons were being made not only by blue lodges, but by private groups. The second innovation named by Gould was less important, but worthy of mention. The new Grand Lodge arbitrarily imposed upon the English craft the use of two compound words new in its vocabulary, entered apprentice and fellow craft. These words were known elsewhere in the craft, but they were new in England. More serious by far was the article on God and religion in the first constitution by which Christianity was no longer to be the only religion recognized by masonry. As Gould remarks, quote, the drawing of a sponge over the ancient charge to be true to God and holy church was doubtless looked upon by many masons of those days in a very much the same manner as we now regard the absence of any religious formulary whatever in the so-called masonry of the Grand Orient of France. End quote. The full import of this article was not realized at first, but it was one factor leading to the great schism which divided the craft for 50 years. Indeed, the epoch of transition, as it has been named, from the old masonry to the new covered a long period, say from 1717 to 1738, when the second book of constitutions was issued, and first papal bull was hurled at the craft. It was a period of ups and downs, all kinds of tangles, new and vexing problems, when the craft was attacked and defended by turns, with many alleged exposures, as well as we know, not only from the record of the craft, but from the items in the papers of the times. The old diarist was right when he said that masonry took a run, and did it non-stop until it reached the ends of the earth. Lodges multiplied charity, flourished, and gentle influence of fraternity spread afar. In spite of the schism within and opposition without, the craft grew almost too rapidly, and measures had to be taken to restrain it, lest it go too fast, making members without making masons. Those fuzzy-minded old men, as they have been called, knew what they were about, and while they made more than one said mistake of policy, they helped forward the brotherhood of man. Even the great schism helped, rather than hindered, the onward march of masonry. All right, that is the end of the series, and I just have to say how incredible the series really was. There were some really interesting things here that we led up to in the last two weeks. Namely, the things that I keep going back to is this idea of the ancient charges, these things that were essentially made up, and it seems like the guys who formed the Grand Lodge really wanted to revitalize this Masonic fraternity in a new way and to keep it around, so they adopted what they agreed would be the most likely, or in their opinion, the most likely forms of things that maybe were done in the past. So these quote-unquote ancient charges, as they put it. And then later on, we have these other things that have come out, like the landmarks of Freemasonry. These are uh, written by Mackey, and then there are a few other versions of them out there. And what's interesting about those is those are also not old or really true to Masonry. There really is no rules to Masonry aside from what these guys made up, and we have given that the power because we've accepted that. And that's okay, but I find it interesting that we have a Masonic Services Association of America paper put out in 1929 that really says, hey, ancient charges really weren't 
anything at all. And and really that to adopt those is in themselves an innovation in Freemasonry. And if we keep reading, we hear that even the Grand Master is kind of an innovation in Masonry and his ability to pick his wardens is an innovation in Masonry. Very interesting stuff. I found the article to be really interesting. And I would urge you guys to go back and you can download the papers via the app. And I would look over them and really pull out some of the key things that are just fascinating to you. Put them on paper and research them a little bit more. Let me know what you find out. Continue the conversation on Facebook and whatnot. And finally, my thought on this episode was in the last paragraph of this article, it says that in spite of the schism within and opposition without, the craft grew almost too rapidly and measures had been taken to restrain it, lest it go too fast, making members without making masons. You know what's funny about that is that we absolutely still do this. We still go too fast and we are making members and not making masons. So if we take anything away from this, aside from the really cool historical information, take this charge from me to you and from this paper to you or however you want to take that. But slow down. Let's make masons, not just members. Now comes the point in the show where I ask you to help support this show. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different ways to do that today. If you head on over to WCYPodcast.com, you can click on Direct Donation through PayPal, which we briefly touched on in the beginning of the program. Of course, you can make that one-time donation, or you can sign up to be a monthly contributor. Contributing $2 a month, $5, or even $10 a month, whatever you choose, really helps the program out. Of course, we have a limited edition shop where you can pick up any number of items that come direct from us. Help us out by going to MasonicRevival.com, but also we have some other affiliates that are really important. Bankers Best, one of the most unique things we've ever done, is to work with Brother Levi Banker out of St. Louis who owns his own company called Bankers Best Beer and skin care. He's been so generous. If you head to wcypodcast.com, click on more, then click on Banker's Best, and you can check out a bunch of the different products he's got. He's got a whole line of beard care products, skin care, oils, balms, all of this stuff, and he has been doing it a long time. He knows a lot about it. Everything is handmade, quality items. We even came up with the King Solomon's Reserve Beard Balm, which is a few years old now, but remains one of the great products that he still offers. Even the artwork on the bottle was done by a brother. The nice thing about this particular product is 50% of the proceeds come back to the program. If you're a history guy like me, then you'll be pleased to know that what makes the beard oil and balm very special is that it was made utilizing the fragrances specific to the exports of King Solomon's time and location, which is amazing. So black fig and honey is the formula. Luxurious scent, as Levi says, truly fit for our first grandmaster. If you use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout, you'll also get a little bit of a percentage off. Please check that out. Bankers Best or just head on over to buybankersbest.com. We also have have a code with on it you can go to our website click on more then go to on it and you can click through any of the links here or just go to onit.com and use the promo code wcy at checkout you'll get 10 percent off and they'll send a little bit back to the program to help us out and of course it's business time the book that i wrote with john t ruark it is making some real waves and people are using it and seeing success so check that out on amazon you can click right to it. You can get it on Audible, Kindle, or in print, even on iBooks. And last but not least, I want to ask you to check out the Great Books program. You'll see the banner for it on the left-hand side, Intellectual Linear Progression. Use the promo code WCY, or you can just click on that link there, and you'll actually go right to the website and hear a little bit from Scott Hambrick about how awesome the program is. So that's it. I hope you guys enjoy, and thank you so much for helping us out. All right, the next piece I have for you this week is called The Reputation of the Fraternity, and this one is another Short Talk Bulletin, volume number eight, and this was published about a year after our last paper, which was in April of 1930. It was number four, and it was attributed to unknown. And again, The Reputation of the Fraternity. Quote, To preserve the reputation of the fraternity, unsullied must be your constant care. End quote. Every Master Mason is charged with that great duty. 
Obviously, it means the reputation of the fraternity before the non-Masonic world. That reputation is one of the greatest assets of Freemasonry. Indeed, only by our reputation do we live and grow, since Masons are forbidden to proselytize. No real Mason ever asks a profane to join the order. The man must seek the light, not the light seeking the man. The reputation of Masonry in the world is that of an order in which men bind themselves to secrecy, practice charity and brotherhood, do good without self-advertising, choose wisely among our petitioners, work a gentle influence upon themselves and their fellows toward right conduct, clean thinking, and fine citizenship. Freemasonry has certain contacts with the public. For instance, her Masonic homes are public in the sense that they stand as monuments to Masonic charity for all the world to see. The world at large observes us in funeral processions, burying our dead with reverence, honor, and ceremonies strange to profane eyes. It watches our Grand Lodges lay the cornerstones of public buildings, pouring the ancient sacrifices of corn, wine, and oil, dedicating and consecrating, if it is a church, the building to its use. It sees us occasionally attend divine service in a body. It can obtain beautiful books about Freemasonry from which it can learn of the fundamental principles which underlie the order. But Quote, the secrets of Freemasonry are safely lodged within the repository of a faithful breast. End quote. Some Masons consider certain matters as secrets, which are not so. In fact, even though they are not the subject of common talk or vain boast, it is no secret that Freemasonry teaches and inculcates, insofar as her power lies, those principles of law, order, morals, citizenship, fear, and love of God, which make the highest type of manhood. The non-secret teachings of the three degrees are briefly as follows. In the entered apprentice degree, the initiate is taught the necessity of a belief in God, of charity towards all mankind, and especially a brother mason, of secrecy, of the meaning of brotherly love, the reasons for relief, the greatness of truth, the advantages of temperance, the value of fortitude, the part played in Masonic life by prudence, and the equality of strict justice. He is charged to inculcate the three great duties, to be reverent before God, to pray to him for help, to venerate him as the source of all that is good. He is exhorted to practice the golden rule and to avoid excess of all kinds. He is admonished to be quiet and peaceable, not to countenance disloyalty and rebellion, to be true and just to government and country, and to be cheerful under its laws. He is charged to come often to lodge, but not to neglect his business, not to argue about Freemasonry with the ignorant, but to learn Masonry from Masons, and once again to be secret. Finally, he is urged to present only such candidates as he is sure will agree to all that he has agreed to. In the Fellowcraft degree, he argues that he will be secret regarding that which must be kept secret, that he will obey the bylaws of his own lodge and the laws, rules, regulations, and edicts of his own Grand Lodge to answer proper summonses. He is again reminded of his duty as a Mason in charity and relief. He agrees that a good Mason is an honest and upright man. He is taught the importance of the seventh day and the advantages of learning in general are placed before him with especial reference to the science of geometry. Emphasis is again placed upon the reverent attitude before deity. Then he is charged with the need for balanced judgment, is exhorted to study the seven liberal arts and sciences, and is shown that geometry is not only a mathematical and Masonic science, but also a moral one. Regular behavior is impressed upon him, as well as the quote-unquote practice of all commendable virtues. In the Master Mason degree, all that has gone before is again emphasized, and many additional duties and responsibilities are laid upon the initiate. Science, secrecy, fidelity to trust, courage, resignation, and sacrifice are taught in the great drama. His obligations are extended. His brotherly relations with his fellows are more clearly and strictly defined. Here is taught the need for willing service, that prayer is not only for the petitioner, that he must be worthy of confidence, that his strength is not only for himself, but also for his falling brother, that wisdom is not only for the possessor, but should be shared, that a brother has the right to know of an approaching disaster. He is charged to set a good example to guard others as well as himself from a breach of fidelity. He must preserve the ancient landmarks, and he must not countenance any changes in our established customs. Secrecy is again emphasized. The dignity of character of a master mason is to be upheld. The faith and the confidence of his fellows is put before him as the reward for fidelity and faith. 
Reducing these great teachings to the least possible number of words and avoiding duplications produces the following list of those matters which a Mason is taught, and to which he promises, either actually or by implication, complete agreement. On these rests the reputation of the fraternity, belief in God, charity, secrecy, brotherly love, relief, truth, temperance, fortitude, prudence, justice, reverence, prayer, veneration, golden rule, peaceableness, good citizenship, obedience to Masonic authority, honesty, observance of the Sabbath, education, judgment, fidelity to trust, courage, resignation, self-sacrifice, service to others, trustworthiness to confidence, sharing strength and wisdom, setting a good example, preservation of the ancient landmarks, faith, dignity. If every Freemason lived up to all of these teachings, what a utopia the world would be. But what is remarkable is not how many Masons fail, but how many succeed. That they do succeed is evidenced by the reputation of the fraternity in non-Masonic circles, where Masons as a class falls to their teachings, lax in their conduct, forsworn as to their obligations, Freemasonry would not possess the fair reputation she has. Quote, Thou shalt love thy Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with every mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. End quote. If the man of Galilee was content to reduce all the law to 53 words, surely Freemasonry might formulate an equally short statement of her aims and purposes. But while all the law may be put into a few words, many thousands of words of New Testament are needed to explain the teachings of Christianity. Men learn by reputation. They absorb that which is told to them, and retold, and told once more. Freemasonry but follows the ancient manner of teaching, when she iterates and reiterates the duties of a Mason toward his God, his neighbor, and himself. But because Freemasonry teaches by repetition, her detailed reiteration makes possible many ways in which a Mason may offend. If he does not actively break a rule, he may fail as a Mason merely by negative attitude. To fail... To do good is not necessarily to do evil, but neither is a failure to work mischief necessarily a doing of good works. It is expected of men that they will fail, otherwise they are not men but gods. If no man ever failed, Freemasonry would be unnecessary. When a building is completed, the workmen depart. When the house not made with hands is perfectedly erected, the craft is of no more use. It is one thing to fail in any Masonic duty, it is another to fail so publicly that the reputation of the fraternity is hurt. That reputation of which we are taught that its preservation is of vital importance. Occasionally, more is the pity, it is necessary for a Masonic organization to take a practical, to take practical steps in regard to some brother who has failed to live up to the Masonic teachings. Masons are only men who have solemnly agreed to do certain things, sometimes they are forsworn. Sometimes our committees do not do their work aright, and we are given cracked stones to work upon. Sometimes a good man changes as he grows older, and even the sweet and gentle influence of the craft cannot hold him in the straight and narrow way. The lodge in which someone holds membership may well be advised to do little rather than much. There are times when something must be done, when the reputation of which we think so much is hurt by failures to do. Then we have all of the misery and pain of a Masonic trial, the sad washing of dirty linen of the lodge, the grief of seeing our good and great order dragged to some extent into public notice whenever a Mason receives the worst Masonic penalty, expulsion, or Masonic death. The world at large usually hears of it. Few are the Masons who have no friends. Hence, a Masonic trial is very apt to create tense feelings in the Lodge, if not worse, and the harmony, which is, quote-unquote, the strength and support of all well-regulated institutions, is made into a discord. However, it cannot always be helped, but in a great many cases it can be helped. It is human to want to get even. Our brothers wrong us. It is only natural to wish him taken before the bar of a lodge opinion and perhaps punish him for his infraction of his obligation. Brethren often see no further than the immediate present and immediate wrongdoing, the immediate lodge trial and its results. A word of wise caution may make him look further. No man, unless suffering wrong of the most grievous character, but may be caused to stop and think by reminding him of the many obligations and duties assumed when he too became a mason. 
Let all such be asked, gently, kindly, considerately, but pointedly. Will this action you propose benefit you as much as it will injure the lodge and the fraternity? Will the results inevitably, to some extent, be public, and do more harm to the reputation which we cherish than they will be good for you? Is it not possible that our erring brother may be brought to make amends by less drastic means than the sad lodge trial? Let no brother retort, quote, but it should not become public, end quote. Agreed, a lodge trial should never be a public manner, but while we hold our own Masonic tie and the cord of secrecy is tight about our lips, we do not hold relations and friends in the same manner. John Smith is tried and suspended, perhaps expelled. He no longer goes to lodge. Perhaps people want to know why. In self-defense, he says what he can, but what can he say? Inevitably, the result of the trial becomes public. Then we suffer. At times it is necessary to stand pain to get rid of a cancer, but the best surgeon does not use a knife until all other means fail. That lodge, that master, and those brethren who seek to compose differences win the erring back to the path their feet should never have left, do a real service to their lodge, to their offended brother, to their erring brother, and to the fraternity whose reputation should be our constant care. To whisper good counsel in the ear of an erring brother is sound Masonic teaching. To prevent tarnishing the reputation of the fraternity, we must not only endeavor to live up to the high level of our teachings, but strive to help our brethren do likewise. The best way, the brotherly way, the way of masonry, is by kindly caution, the friend word of admonition, the hand stretched out to assist and save the worthy falling brother. Only when these fail, and never then, until after thinking first of the order, next of the lodge, and last of self, should we go to the court of last resort, prefer charges, have a trial, and do ourselves the injury which comes always from the knife of publicity in the body of our ancient craft. Freemasonry, so we truly believe, is one of God's bright tools for shaping of the rough ashlar which we are. Let us strive to keep it bright. All right, there you go. Another good charge to everybody out there, to myself, to you all listening. A wonderful piece explaining some of the reputation of the fraternity and just how important that is. Now, there are things they mention within this piece that are still relevant today. Let's think about that. Over 85 years ago, this paper was written and published, and it's still true. We haven't learned our lessons, but maybe there's hope for the future. But that's it for this week. I hope you guys all enjoyed. Please make sure you check out all of those great ways to support this show. Please check out the Masonic Roundtable going live every Thursday night at 9.30, 8.30 Central. Check out the Midnight Freemasons three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for new articles. And I'll see you all maybe at the Ken Tan Lodge, number 1186, Buffalo, New York, through a Skype presentation. Also, December 3rd, Monday, Lafayette Lodge, number 123, Indiana. I'll be doing Esoterics 101 down there, and that'll be a pretty fun night as well. A little off in the schedule, so down in December will be the next thing after this upcoming presentation here this week. That's it. Until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.